Why Must I Suffer? A Book of Light and Consolation by the Rev. F. J. Rimler Copyright 1923 Reasons Why You Must Suffer The Final Reason in the Book Fifteenth Reason Predestination to an Exalted Degree of Glory in Heaven The fifteenth and last reason why you must suffer may be this. God who loves you with a love that surpasses all understanding may have predestined you to enjoy for all eternity an exceptionally high degree of glory in heaven. If you are weighed down by heavy crosses and painful afflictions, despite the fact that you have long tried to lead a sinless life and to love God above all things, it is very likely because the divine goodness has most wonderful designs on you for eternity. As the sun, moon, and stars differ greatly in size and brilliancy, so also do the saints in heaven differ greatly in the splendor of their glory. Our divine Savior assures us that on the day of judgment every man shall receive his own proper reward of good or of evil, and that in his Father's house, that is, in heaven, there are many mansions. The glory and happiness that will be allotted to the elect will be of many varieties, both as to kind and as to degree. No doubt there are many saints who possess what are the lowest degrees, such as infants who died after baptism before they attained the use of reason, and pagans and lifelong sinners who were converted just before death. But there are also very many who are crowned with a glory and an honor so immense that they will rank with the most exalted of the angelic choirs. Some may even be still higher. This, we know, is the case with the Blessed Virgin Mary, whose glory far exceeds that of all the angels and saints. Now, may it not be that you who are reading these lines may also be one of those whom the goodness of God has predestined to one of the highest places in heaven? Should this be the case, and there is no reason why it may not be, then know that you can take possession of your appointed place only if, at the moment of your death, you have attained that degree of sanctity which is commensurate with the particular degree of glory intended for you. This gives rise to the very important question, by what means will you manage to attain that exalted degree of holiness which will entitle you to receive this glory? A life of mere ordinary goodness, made up of the avoidance of sin, the saying of your daily prayers, the reception of the sacraments, and the performance of good works will be insufficient. As scaling a high and steep mountain is vastly more difficult than walking to the top of a gently sloping hill, and demands strenuous and persevering efforts, so also is it with the attainment of the sanctity required of those who are destined for the higher places in heaven. Only the most heroic efforts persevered in till death will enable souls to reach the summit of the mountain of Christian perfection. Now it may well be that for this strenuous work you have neither the strength nor even the desire. Hence, if you were left to your own initiative, you would in no way come nearer reaching the degree of sanctity God wants you to attain. This would mean total failure in your endeavor to win the throne and crown of glory prepared for you in heaven. But fortunately, God is not willing to see you forgo what he has so generously set aside for you. Even though you are so lamentably blind to your best interests that you do not care whether you win it or not. And so he takes the sanctification of your soul in his own hands. By gentle pressure, yet without compulsion of your will, he makes you do what you have neither the courage nor the desire to undertake of your own accord. You can surmise what means he employs. It is the cross, pains, afflictions, tribulations, temptations, and a word, sufferings of all kinds, which follow one upon the other in seemingly endless succession. Here is the unraveling of a secret that has long been a puzzle to you. It explains that slow and troublesome illness which has cast you on a bed of suffering these many months or years, and perhaps 
bids fair to keep you there till the end of your life. It explains those cruel disappointments, that extreme poverty, those crushing humiliations, those heartless persecutions, which come to you not only from your enemies, but also from your relatives, friends, and superiors, perhaps. It explains further those painful interior trials which are often harder to bear than bodily sufferings, those persistent and violent temptations against faith or hope or charity or any other virtue, that dryness, that disgust at times for prayer, the sacraments, and spiritual things in general, and finally the hardest of all, the desolation of spirit by which it often seems to you that God has rejected and already condemned you as a reprobate to the torments of hell. If you examine your painful state in the light of faith, you will discover in all this apparent cruelty at the hands of God the most convincing proofs of God's tender love for you. He is preparing you to become a worthy occupant of the throne of marvelous glory He has so generously prepared for you in His kingdom. You know that the vine must be pruned year after year if it is to bear an abundance of luscious fruit that the diamond must undergo a slow and laborious process of grinding and polishing, if it is to delight the eye with its highest degree of brilliancy. And the gold must be subjected to the action of intense heat, if it is to be freed from all dross and rendered perfectly pure. So also must your soul now undergo the processes, as it were, of pruning, polishing, and refining so that she may be worthy of taking her place among the most exalted choirs of angels and saints. To make this important point still clearer, let us have recourse to numbers. Let it be supposed that to obtain the degree of glory intended for you, you stand in need of one million degrees of merit. If it depended entirely on your own efforts, you might not succeed in gaining more than half that number and the attainment of your own crown would be hopelessly beyond your reach. Something is badly needed to supply this deficiency, and and what can that be? One thing only, sufferings, the balance of the necessary merits you must acquire by cheerfully carrying the cross which God places on your shoulders for this purpose. Again, the glory intended for you may correspond to several millions of degrees of merits, In that case, you would not be able to amass the required amount, even if you practice the most heroic self-denial, humility, charity, and the other Christian virtues. A second time, God comes to your assistance. He subjects you to the ordeal of suffering to such an extent as He knows is necessary to enable you to procure the purchase price of your exalted rank in heaven. This truth is clearly illustrated in the lives of the saints who invariably suffered the more here on earth, the higher they were to be elevated in glory hereafter. Viewed in this light, do you not discover a new and deep meaning in these words of sacred scripture? Whom the Lord loveth, he chastiseth, and as a father in the son he pleaseth himself. What a wonderful joy and happiness you will experience for all eternity if you succeed in mastering the truth about suffering here explained, in all your afflictions, lovingly resigning yourself to the ever-blessed will of Him who has decreed such a marvelous glory for you in the life to come. Instead of looking upon sufferings as a curse and a punishment and murmuring against divine providence, try rather to welcome your trials, rejoice in them, and fervently thank God for giving you so unmistakable a pledge of His most tender love for you. If you master the truth about the real nature and uses of sufferings, you will soon think of them as the saints did, and instead of praying to be delivered from them, you will after their example even pray for them. Lord, not to die but to suffer was the heroic prayer of St. Teresa. Here ends the reading. Thanks be to God.